with me if you will. We're reading from the 15th chapter of Luke this morning. So we continue our study of this great parable. I'm going to start uh, this morning in verse uh, 17, Luke 15 and verse 17, the prodigal son has been gone and now is coming to himself. And it says, when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he rose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put the ring on his finger and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. Father, uh, to think that you celebrate the return of prodigals like us is uh, kind of beyond our imagination, but uh, it's what you teach us, it's what we understand from your word. It sounds like all of heaven from the first parables in this, in this uh, chapter is rejoicing over one sinner who repents. And so we thank you for the love that you have for us. Father, I, I cannot, nowhere near adequate to try and explain this to myself, let alone to others. So I beg of you, may your Holy Spirit minister among us this morning to bring home to us the greatness, the extended infinity of the love of God that's extended to those who repent and turn their lives to him. Father, we pray for the uh, safe return of Jesse as he's been gone to Thailand on this mission trip. We pray um, that you will bring him back to us safely as I think he's returning home today. We pray for the uh, missionaries that are in various places. John and Jan are here this morning. We thank you for them and the ministry they have among Spanish-speaking people in Greeley and among uh, the athletic teams at UNC and among uh, good news clubs, just lots of different places. We pray that you will bless them richly. We pray for Daniel Losey as we hear that he's feeling better than he has in years and yet the white blood cell count continues to go down. And so uh, he's, he's in, com continues to be in unchartered territory. We pray that you will bring understanding to the doctors and to those who are ministering to him, that you will continue to bless his folks as they translate the scriptures for this uh, group in the, in the Middle East who otherwise have your, not, do not have your word. We thank you for those that you've brought to Christ because of that. But some of them have suffered persecution. One or two of them have been killed. We think of the four families of the men that Jesse's worked with who over the last few weeks, the last couple of weeks have been killed because they are just translating your word. What a world we live in, but it's always been this way. We just live in this sheltered bubble in the United States. We thank you for that. We thank you for the country. We thank you for those who are protecting our freedoms. We pray that you will continue to allow us to be a beacon of light, but Father, help us to be that. Help us not to be those who are sitting back and taking our ease because we happen to live in this privileged place. Rather, help us to realize that all of us here this morning will give an account one day for what we did with our time and our place here on this corner. We will answer to you. And so we pray that we will have the right answers. Bless us this morning. Help us to be, Lord, just loving you more as a result of being here, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. May be seated. Um, thank you. It's great to see our visitors from Trigo Ranch here this morning again as well. The ranch we're going to call it from now on, but I um, have a bunch of them here this morning, more than before, and I think we're grateful to have you as well. And any other visitors who are here, as I look out, I see a few faces that I don't know. Thank you for being with us. We pray God's blessing on you as we worship together. Turn with me, if you will, to Luke 15, if you're not already there. We've been studying this great parable and we've seen how the lessons from the young man who went away and came back uh, the last week, this week, and probably next week, we'll be looking at the father in the parable who represents God, God the Father. What great lessons we learned from him. Some of you may be familiar with uh, Garrison Keeler. Is that a name that rings the bell? If you listen to NPR radio, you may know him. Um, storyteller, you know, 
tells about his, he's always talking about his childhood in Lo- Wobegon, I think Minnesota or someplace like that. Um, kind of an interesting character, very wry sense of humor. But he says this at one point in time, one of his writings, he says that he's talking about choosing up sides for baseball when, when you were kids. You all remember that? And, uh, and uh, that could either be a good thing or a bad thing depending on when you got chosen, right? So he says this, he says, the captains are down to their last grudging choices. The slow kid for catcher, someone to stick in right field where no one ever hits it, the scrubs, the remaining kids, they treat as handicaps. If I take him, you have to take him. Sometimes I go as high as sixth, usually lower, but just once, just once. I'd like Daryl to pick me first and say, I want him the skinny kid with the glasses and the black shoes. You, I want you. But I've never been chosen with much enthusiasm. (laughs) Perhaps you have felt that way. Perhaps leaving the baseball aside, you feel that way. Well, I have good news. God loves you. I wish I could say that in some way that would grip your heart with the way that I know God wants it to be gripped. God loves you. Whatever anybody else may want, God wants you. God loves you. God chooses with enthusiasm those who wholeheartedly choose him. He says in Genesis 29, verse 13, you shall seek me and shall find me when you seek me with all your heart. God loves us. As we look at this father in this parable, we've seen that he represents God. And it certainly shows him as an active, enthusiastic participant in human life. We said there are eight things here, eight characteristics of God, eight things that God the Father does for us that are highlighted. And we looked at the first two last week. First of all, he lets us go. He lets us go. This is his patience. He allows us to go our own way if we choose to do that. And we can live for a time as though he did not exist or as though he did not matter. If we continue down that path, there's not a pretty end at the end because in fact he does exist and he does matter. That's what he's trying to show us here. We saw secondly that he longs for us to turn to him even though he lets us go. He lets us go with the hope that we will turn to him, that we will come back. He does not impose himself. We see that so many places in Scripture, but he patiently waits. Now this morning, I want us to see three more characteristics of this wonderful God who would love to be our Father if we would allow him to do that. So the third characteristic, God absorbs our shame This is his mercy. God absorbs our shame. This is him not giving us what we do deserve. Now, we hinted at this one last week, so a couple of these items will be uh, familiar, but I want to unpack this just a little bit further. Notice in verses 18 through 20 there, the young man talks about how he's going to get up and go to his father because he's realized the the, uh, terribleness of his situation and how he has offended his father and and how the servants who live there are better off than he is. This is an important part of this parable because see, nothing positive happens spiritually until repentance enters the scene, right? It can't. We are offending a holy God and we must acknowledge that before he can respond. But when we do, the floodgates of God's mercy are just turned loose on us. We may not see it or understand it completely. But God is doing things in our lives that we would never imagine when we become repentant. Now, some of you are saying, well, but I'm not a rebel like this kid. This is not me. I mean, surely, you know, I don't need to do that. I'm a pretty good guy or I'm a pretty good woman. Why should I need to repent? But beloved... Can you see that even that statement itself, that statement itself flies in the face of what God has done 
to say I don't need to repent, to say I'm good enough to be in the presence of a holy, righteous, completely, infinitely wonderful God, to say I don't need any help from him, if nothing else, it rejects his word at many points. It says in Isaiah 53, 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one of us to his own way. And the only way back is that God has laid on him, on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. You may not be a rapist or a child molester. I hope you're not. But all of us here have gone our own way. We've all disowned him. Even as believers, we continue an occasion to disown him. We commit the worst sin of all when we say, I don't need to repent. I don't need to come back. I don't need to turn to him. When we declare our worth and declare that what, what he has done is not of value, ultimate value. We shame him and we shame ourselves. But repentance changes everything. See, repentance changes everything. He says in verse 19, the son is going to say, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. He's sitting in the pig pen, kind of, you know, getting his speech together, which is a good thing to do if you've left home like he did, right? He's realized that he just wants to eat what the pigs are eating. I mean, that's how low he's gone. He's in a pig pen. It's as low as a Jewish boy could have could go, but he's gotten beyond his own shame. And now he's thinking a little bit about somebody else. He's thinking about how he's shamed his own father. And he reaches the right conclusion that he's not worthy to be called the son of his father. I mean, he gave that privilege up a long time ago. He abandoned that. Just as we all have, God's verdict is, for we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Not some, but all of us. So it says in verse 20, but he arose and came to his father. What's his first reaction as his heart softens? He goes toward the father instead of away from the father. What's our first reaction when we sin for the umpteenth time? Something that we've been trying to get victory over or we re re begin to recognize who we are in God's sight. What, what's the first thing we want to do? Run away. We want to cover up. And God is saying, no, no. The thing that needs to be done is what this young man does. He heads toward God rather than away. He freely confesses that he has sinned against God and against heaven. That he is the one who is offended. But he's just hoping and thinking, maybe my father will be gracious here. See, there, there's two great signs of a repentant heart. First one is a repentant heart realizes its own unworthiness. And the longer we're sitting there thinking, well, I'm, you know, I'm not that bad, we got a problem. A repentant heart realizes it is far short of the glory of God, whatever the sin has been. However good or however bad our life may have been, it falls short of the glory of God. It realizes that. The second thing it does is it heads toward God instead of away from God. It looks to him for the repentance that he can give because of the death of Christ. So this young man's turn is remarkable. He's ready to turn back to the Father. But, but what comes next is really astounding. See, the, the Pharisees would have been sitting there thinking, well, okay, great, this is, this is good. Life has finally caught up with this kid. <laughs> He's getting what he deserved all along shaming his father like he did, running away like that, and now he's going to go back. This is good because his father is going to have the opportunity to turn the screws on this kid. This is going to be good. You know, it's like watching a John Wayne movie, and you can hardly wait till the end of it, right, when he's going to get, it, get back at that guy, right? That, that's, that's just what's the way they think. He, he can, this kid's never going to be able to, able to repay his father, so dad will certainly take it out on him. This is good. This kid's going to get what he asked for. That's what they're thinking. That would be a great end of the story as far as they are concerned. So what Jesus does is astounding. No one in Jesus' time would have thought in terms of what he does in verse 20. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Wow. You know, the first thing that I notice there is he's in the father's embrace before he can really 
say anything. He's got his speech all rehearsed, but he doesn't even have time to give it before the Father has him in his arms. You know, one of the things that shows us is that God sees our heart. It really doesn't matter what we do outwardly. God sees our heart. God knows whether that heart is toward him or whether that heart is against him. Either way, he knows. You can't fool, you might fool all the people, but you can't fool God. And in this case, he knows that this young man's heart is toward him. I would guess that most of us who are here this morning as believers, assuming that you're a believer, you've really come to faith in Christ, we probably can look back on the time when we, when we prayed that prayer and we, and we gave our heart to the Lord. We said, would you, you know, would you, I want to confess my sinfulness and I, I give my heart and my life to you. I ask you to forgive me. And we remember that and we think, well, that's when I was saved. But you know what? That's not true. That prayer, assuming it happened and that it was real, was the result of a, of a change that had happened in the heart already. Now, the heart change may have, may have come minutes before. It may have come weeks before. I don't know when the heart change came, but whenever that heart change came, that's when you were in the Father's embrace. That moment. All the words can do is kind of seal the fact that this decision has been made, but... We're in the Father's embrace the moment our heart turns toward Him. And from that point on, the Bible tells us in Romans 8, 16, that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit Himself, now bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. That's the embrace of God in your life constantly. You can't go anywhere that the Holy Spirit isn't with you, that the embrace of the Father is not upon you. Now, there's a second thing that I see here, though, that's interesting about this. The father did not make the son come to him. You notice that? The father went running to the son. Now, that's very significant, and it's, it's more significant when you understand the culture in which this man lived. An elderly man in that society would never be caught running. Most of us elderly guys in our society might not be caught running, but there's a different reason for that. In that society, if you were going to run like this guy did, the first thing you had to do is, you know, you had to take your toga and you had to tuck it up in a belt that you would have up there and, you know, your legs would be exposed so that you wouldn't trip over that whatever thing they wore in those days. But to expose your legs in that culture was like, whoa, that, you just didn't do that. It wasn't done. So here's this father girding himself up, girding his loins up. It's the only old King James phrase. That's what it means, to take your robe and tie it up so you could run. Why would he do that? Why didn't he just save himself that exposure? You know, the son's going to be there in a couple minutes. They could have their reunion privately. Why does he do this? Here's why he does this. Beloved, this man knows that the whole village is going to be a buzz about this young boy coming back. They know what he's done. They know the shame that he's brought on the family. And he realizes that if his son has to come through that village to get to his home, that he's going to be faced with these people who are going to be mocking him, who are, they're, 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 going to, they're, they're going to be glorying in his disgrace. They're going to be pouring contempt on him. And so the father determines that he's going to protect his son from the certain abuse that's going to be his. So unmindful of his own indignity, he girds himself up and he runs to his son. He's determined to take the boy's shame on himself. That's what he's doing. And so he runs to the boy and before anybody can get to him, there he is hugging the boy, kissing the boy, Telling the boy, welcoming the boy home, returning him to sonship before anybody else has a chance to say anything. Jesus' hearers would have been absolutely stunned at this turn of events. They could never have imagined a father with this kind of grace. It would have been incredible that this retrobate, reprobate could be restored with no requirement put upon him whatsoever. This is incredible. What a picture of the heavenly father, isn't it? looking down upon humankind, some better than others, but all falling far short of his glory, all with sinfulness in their lives, all with no hope of redemption except through him. 
And so what God demands, God supplies. So what Jesus has been telling his disciples all along, they haven't gotten it yet, but they will. Like in Luke 18, you know, verse 32, where Jesus says he told, Jesus told his disciples that he, the son of man, will be delivered to the Gentiles, will be mocked, will be shamefully treated and spit upon. And after the flogging, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will arise. Why did Jesus suffer that shameful treatment? Did he deserve the shame that was heaped upon him? Of course not. So why did he do it? For us, for you, for me. That's why Jesus did it. He took our shame on the cross. We saw the verse last week where he says in Hebrews 12, 2, that Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame. Why did Jesus absorb the shame that he didn't deserve? He did it because, as the Bible says in Romans 9, 33, so that whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Shame we deserve has already been paid. He tells us in Romans 10, verse 11, everyone who believes in me will not be put to shame. Listen, do we deserve to be put to shame? Absolutely. And because of Christ, we need not be. Beloved, I know that there are some of you, because I know me, who are ashamed of your past. There are things in your past you wish you could change, and you can't go back and change them. I don't know what it's been. It doesn't matter what it's been. It could be really bad stuff in some cases. You've been in sexual sin that you shouldn't have been involved in. At the very least, your mind has been there. You've been involved in some kind of disloyalty. You've been involved in shaming friends. You've been involved in es escapades of anger and, 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 and whatever else, drunkenness, wherever. You've been there. And your past perhaps haunts you. I have good news. He took the shame for you. You don't have to take the shame. This is why the Bible says in Romans 5.20, and this is to believers, where sin abounded, and me meaning it's piled up, there's a whole bunch of it, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Grace just comes in like a fire hose and sweeps it away. He took our shame. You know, one of the many foolish things I did when I was in junior high well, one of the few foolish things I did. <laughs> you can rephrase that. We used to go down to the elementary school uh, where I had gone to elementary school because there was a big playground down there that was very close to our home. So we would play ball down there. Football, baseball, whatever the season was. And it was great and we really enjoyed it, but the school wasn't being used anymore. So it was just sitting there. Nobody in it, nobody ever occupying it, nothing going on there. It was just an old building. And it had a lot of windows in it. The windows were great. They were, became especially good as targets after a while. And so some of the kids that I was with, not me, but some of the kids began to pick up rocks and throw them through the windows and break the windows. Why is that fun? I don't know, but it was a lot of fun. Some of you may have been a kid and you remember how fun that would have been. And I thought, boy, we shouldn't be doing that. Somebody's gonna catch up with us. So I wouldn't do that. But then after, you know, a few weeks went by and they kept doing that. Every time we went down there, you know, the end of the ball game would be, let's break out a few windows. And so a few more windows would go. And after a few weeks and nobody got caught, I thought, well, shoot, that looks like fun. I think I'll do that too. And so I did. And I broke out windows. And it wasn't very long before Bob Johnson, the truant officer, was, was, was knocking on our door. I think I've told this story before, you may remember. He was looking to shame some truants of whom I was one. I deserved to be hauled off, brought before the juvenile court to suffer the consequences for my actions. And I can tell you, I felt the shame deeply. It's one of the reasons I truly believe I really was a Christian at that point in time. I didn't always act like it, but I can tell you the Holy Spirit <laughs> worked in my life. I felt the shame deeply. But you know what happened? My dad stepped in. And my dad 
went down to that old school and he bought a bunch of windows that he didn't have money for. And he took time that he didn't have to go put windows in that building. I don't know how many he did, just know he did a bunch of them so that I wouldn't have to suffer the consequences of what I had done. I didn't have to face the shame of what I had done because dad stepped in and paid the price. He absorbed the shame for me for a building that would never be used that would be torn down in another year. That's what our Heavenly Father does. And I don't care what the shame, I don't care what you've done, I don't care where you've been, I don't care how big or how little it is. The Father has absorbed the shame through the Son on our behalf. Isn't it good to belong to God? Fourth thing that I see here is God lavishes us with love. This is his grace. This is his grace. God lavishes us with love. What an amazing picture. Verse 20, he arose, came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, the father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. I mean, those words alone show us the lavish love of the father. Here's this old man who shouldn't be running and is, probably hadn't run in 40 years, and he is running toward this son. The very fact that he sees him says that he must have been looking for him all the time because he sees him afar off. So he's been watching, he's been hoping, he's been thinking maybe that son will return. And when he does, he sees him and he runs and he takes him in his embrace. Oblivious to the stares of the people that are around. Before the prodigal can even begin his carefully rehearsed search, you know, the father has him in his arms. What an amazing exhibition of unconditional love. This is not love that says, well, 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 are you come, I, why are you here? What are you doing? What are you coming back for? What do you expect? It's not that. This is unconditional love on the part of the Father. Rembrandt did a great picture of this, famous scene. It shows the, no, no, John, if you do the thing, I think there's a, is there a picture on the screen? I'm not sure. Well, you can't see it. doesn't matter. But you get the idea. There's the picture of this, of this boy on his knees in contrition before his father. If you could see the picture well enough, you'd see that the father's impeccably dressed. His dress contrasts with the kind of the, you know, the shreds that the son is wearing in his, in his, in his uh, sandals and his clothing. <coughs> Others are standing by with, uh, with looks of contempt on their face, but the father, you can only see the kindness in his eyes. There's a big masculine hand laying on the right hand of the son <laughs> saying, I'm glad you're back. There's a small feminine hand. It's interesting how Rembrandt painted them differently. A small feminine hand pulling him in. I love you. I'm so glad you're back. You don't have to say anything. I'm just happy to see you. The boy smells of the pig pen. I mean, think about that. Where's he been? He hasn't had a bath. There's no Marriott's on the way, and he wouldn't have had money to pay for one if he'd seen one. He's right off the road. He's dusty. He's smelly. He's dirty. But the father accepts him just as he is. Just as he is. The father takes him back. He requires nothing. That's the starting point. Now, he's not going to leave him there, but that's where he accepts him. That's where he takes him just as he is. He's seen the heart of this boy. He's seen the repentance there. And he's going to come along and he's going to fix him up with the finest clothes. He's going to fix him up with the ring of the show sonship. And I'm sure he got him a bath. I'm sure that was high on the agenda, I'm guessing. Cleaned him up. The father lavishes him with love. The Pharisees didn't understand this at all. If they were telling the story, the father would have been standing there with arms folded and he would have been saying, what are you doing here? You have no right here. How dare you come back into my town and into my home? How dare you expect anything from me? You know what you did. You're a dirty, filthy, smelly mess. You got what you deserve. You were a poor excuse for a man now, you're a poor excuse for a man then, and you're a poor excuse for a man now. 
I want nothing to do with you. You want, it, you want back in my good graces? Come back when you've got all the money that you took from me with interest. And then maybe we can talk about a place as a slave in my house, maybe. But until then, I don't know you. I disown you. That's the Pharisees. That's where they would have been. That would have been their reaction. But the Father sees the heart. The Father knows, and Jesus knows the Father, and Jesus knows grace. I mean, the question, the question for us is, can we accept this from the Father? Can we accept the fact that even when we were in the far country, Jesus died for us? That's what Romans 5, 8 teaches. It says, God shows his love for us, and that while we were yet sinners, when we were still in the pig pen, Jesus died for us. Jesus took our shame. God did that for us while we were still in a far country with no thought of turning home. Christ paid the penalty. Imagine the joy when we actually show up. When we turn our heart toward him. John couldn't get over it. John says one of my favorites, I got a lot of favorite chapters, but this is one in 1 John 3. It's a wonderful chapter of 3 verse 1. John says, see what kind of love the Father has for us that we should be called the children of God. That's amazing. And John, who was as close as any person on earth to Jesus, he's the one that John throughout his gospel calls the one that Jesus loved. He was... That, that got into his heart so much. His relationship with Jesus was that close. He was the one who was, who was at the breast of Jesus on the night of the Last Supper, John. That John who knew Jesus intimately, he still couldn't get over the fact that he was called the Son of God. And so we are, he says. We're the children of God. Couldn't get over it. Loved lavishly, accepted unconditionally and unbelievably and gracious by a gracious heavenly Father. I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what the shame in your life this morning. You can be a child of God. And if you are a child of God, you are lavishly loved. Whatever you have done, whatever you do in the future. Love of God is incredible, beloved. If we could, it, when you get a hold of the love of God, it changes your life. Charlotte Elliott was an English woman years ago, disabled. In those days, you know, you became disabled and usually there wasn't a whole lot they could do for you, so she was crippled. She had become very embittered against God because of this condition. Felt like she couldn't get married, would never get married. She was, she was very unhappy. She said, if God loves me, how could he let this happen to me? Well, a minister from Switzerland visited their home one day. Family was a Christian home. The guy's name was Dr. Cesar Milan. 1822, May, he came and visited their home. They had dinner night after night while he was there. And one night, Charlotte, for something, set her off. Don't know what it was, but something just set her off. And she just began to rail against God and against her family and against everything. It got bad enough that her family, the, the, the outrage was so vitriolic, the family just got up and left the table. They didn't know what to do. The Dr. Milan stayed. And when her outburst finally, you know, the thyroid finally abated a little bit, he said, Charlotte, <laughs> he said, you're tired of yourself, aren't you? You're tired of yourself. You are bitter. Your anger and your hatred have become your identity. You don't like who you've become, but you don't know how to help it. You can't help it. You just are who you are. You're bitter. I said, yeah, that's, that's me. You, you think you got a cure? He said, well, I can tell you this. I can tell you that the cure is to come to the Lord who loves you infinitely in spite of your resentment. But you need to come to him they talked a little further and Charlotte finally said, she said, so if I wanted the peace and joy that you possess, what would I do? He said, well, you would just come just as you are. And he quoted to her John 6, 37, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Never cast out. Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. You see, I can't, 
I can't take myself out of God's hands. No, you can't, not if you truly came. I can't sin my way out of God's hands. No, you can't, not if you truly come to him. I can't resent my way out of God's hands. No, he, he, he will discipline you, but you can't, dis- you can't take yourself out of God's hands. Charlotte wrapped her arms around that verse. She came to the Lord, changed her life. A few weeks later, her brother, who was a Christian minister, asked her, he said, I need some brochures for uh, some kind of a fundraising thing or something that he was doing. So she put the verse, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out, John 6, 37. She put that on the, on the little thing that she made up. And then she, then she put a poem on there that she wrote. Just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. And that... Thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God. I come. I come. You recognize the song. That's where it came from. Just as you are, God accepts you. Listen, he'll go to work on you. He'll start peeling off the levels of dirt right away. But he'll take you where you are. Fifth thing God does is he cleans us up. This is forgiveness. I don't think there's a more wonderful word than this. Once, if we really, once we really understand who we are and who God is, there's no more wonderful word than forgiven, right? It doesn't get any better than that. Forgiven. Forgiven. And this young prodigal is, is the Bible's pinnacle example of forgiveness. He is, he, is, he is the worst of the worst. And yet when he comes home, when he turns to the Father, he is freely totally, unreservedly, comprehensively forgiven. The slate is absolutely wiped clean as though he never did anything wrong. Because he earned it? He could never have earned it. He could never have earned back what he took away. He could never have earned the money. He could never have earned the interest. He could never have taken away the shame that he had that his actions had put on his family. There's no way he could have ever earned it. No, it's entirely by grace. It's by grace. It's by grace that he gets this. Look at him, he says in verse 21, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. That's heartfelt, genuine repentance. When you get to that point, I can promise you God will never turn you away, but you must get to that point. He's got the rest of his speech planned. He never gets to make it. The father waves him off before he can even finish the speech. Verse 22, middle of the verse, he says, bring quickly the best robe, put it on him. Put the ring on his finger and the shoes on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this, my son was dead and he's alive again and was lost and is found. This is complete, comprehensive forgiveness and cleansing and restoration. Just what God offers to everyone who believes. Psalm 103, I mean, you know the verse, although you may not recognize the address. Psalm 103, verse, Psalm 103, verse five, as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Did you ever think how far east is from the west? It's further than north is from south. No, it, it is, literally. If you walk toward the North Pole, I mean, I don't advise that, it's cold up there, but I mean, if you walk toward the North Pole, you're gonna hit a point, a certain point, and you just keep going in the same direction, and guess what? You're gonna be going south. You don't have to change direction, you don't have to do anything. You just walk up there, you're going north, and all of a sudden, you're going south. But you can't do that going east and west. You start off in the, going toward the east, and guess what? If you don't turn around, you're gonna be going east forever. The only way you can get to the west is by turning around. That's why Jesus didn't say as far as the north is from the south. He said as far as the east is from the west. It's infinitely far. He tells us in other places that our sins are cast into the depths of the sea. There is no end to the forgiveness of God, beloved. He loves you. You turn to him and he takes away every sin. He wipes the slate clean. Clean record from that point on. You remember, 
some of you have seen the, you know, the film, uh, the, the C.S. Lewis film, the Narnia Qualic Chronicles, The uh, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And if you've seen that, you may remember that Edmund, one of the, one of the four children, there's two sisters and two brothers, and Edmund is taken in by the White Witch. The White Witch represents Satan in that film. And she lures him away. The other three somehow avoid this, but she lures him away with the Turkish delight, the, the, the language that, that uh, C.S. Lewis uses is, is, is remarkable. I don't know whether I like Turkish delight or not because I don't know, but I know the name is really descriptive. What draws us away from God? Things that delight us other than God. And so Edmund is taken in by this Turkish delight. But he soon finds himself imprisoned by this white witch. No way to get away. So Aslan the lion, who represents Christ in the film, sends rescuers. Edmund is rescued through no fault of his own, no effort of his own. He is rescued. And then there's a scene that you can see in, in profile. You can see Edmund and and Aslan having this great conversation, right? You can see that, that Edmund is repenting of his sin, acknowledging his sinfulness. And Aslan is accepting him back. And then Edmund goes over toward the family, but before he can say anything or before any of them can say anything about what a stupid guy he is or him, him having to apologize to them, the, Aslan comes over and he says to the rest of them, he says, what's done is done. There's no need to speak to Edmund about the past. The past is over, beloved, when you come to Christ. The past is over. It's a wonderful picture of forgiveness. Now, the film goes on to show that that didn't happen without a price being paid. Aslan has to go pay a price. We'll talk about that next week. The price has to be paid before the forgiveness can be offered, but here it comes, and for us, it's free. So for those who believe in Jesus, the price is paid. The forgiveness is free. The cleansing is absolute. The past is over. It's over. It's over and done with. You know, we have to grasp, we are, we are believers, because believers, believers have this, I, you know, and I put myself at the top of this, we have this tremendous tendency to wallow in the past, it's long forgiven. I had a friend of mine who was preaching on this one time and he said, you know, when you, you go to God as a believer and you've asked his forgiveness and, you, and it gets on your nerves and you come back and you ask him and you say, would you please forgive me for this? And he says, what? I, I forgot all about that until you brought it up. God promises in Joel, this is a, this is a great promise. Joel 2.25, I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the past is past. Here's the deal. We're all the skinny kid with the black glasses hoping to be chosen, right? In Christ, God has said, I want you. I choose you. Not 455th, not 10,564,365th. I choose you first. I want you. You. I want you. I choose you. That's why I went to the cross. That's the Father's love. So I don't know. Are you still in the far country playing your own game? You know, working to your own agenda? Living in your own pig pen? It's better in the Father's house. It's a lot better in the Father's house. Stories told how Samuel Goldwyn's secretary came in one time. She wanted to destroy all the old files that were at least 10 years old or older. She said, can I do that? We're getting so much paperwork out here. I just, I just need to destroy these. Never use them. Can't we just get rid of them if they're 10 years old or older? He says, sure, get rid of them, but make sure you keep a copy of everything. <laughs> God keeps no copies. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this reminder. Lord, I, I, I wish I could understand your love better. I wish I could communicate it better. But what, here's what I pray. I pray that your Holy Spirit who can communicate it, who does know all about it, 
will reach into every heart that's here this morning. I pray that those who are still in the far country and they've never come to you, they've thought about it, perhaps, but for one reason or another, they just want to hang on to what is most important to them, which is not you. And so I pray that you'll help them to see this morning, whatever it is that they're holding on to is very temporary. You are permanent. Whatever they're holding on to will eventually destroy them. You will give them the opposite, eternal life. May they please come to you just now, right now, confess their sin, give their life to you, let you remake them, regenerate them. I pray for that. For those who are believers, but they're here this morning, still hanging on to the past, or the past is hanging on to them. Lord, somehow get through to all of our hearts how forgiven we are in Jesus Christ. What a wonderful thing to have a father like this who's borne our shame, lavished us with love, and now has cleaned us up. Help us not to put, put on the old stuff again. What a mistake. Bless us as we sing now, Father, this great hymn of invitation. I, I, I pray that it would open our hearts to you in a new way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand?